Initially, when writing out the script for this video, I had a three-page intro delving into what made Prometheus such a polarizing film, but seeing as this video is already almost an hour long, I've decided to streamline everything and quickly cover the main points. So, in terms of answering the questions it poses, Prometheus leaves much to be desired. I'll list a few of these unresolved questions on the screen right now. Not only this, but for whatever reason, there are pieces of pivotal plot information that were completely left out of the film. These decisions are made even more irksome if you read the original script, Alien Engineers, written by John Spates, which explains many of the plot holes from the final film, meaning that either Ridley Scott or Damon Lindelof made the conscious decision to omit the answers to some of these questions. Whatever their logic was for making these cuts, the result was the same. Prometheus is filled with plot holes and contrivances that enraged Alien fans and confused the hell out of mainstream audiences. Did you see Prometheus? I don't think the writers even knew what that was about. It's nearly impossible for viewers to invest themselves in a movie when they don't understand fundamental aspects of the film or why characters are even making the decisions they make. In essence, the film we got just did not work. So in today's video, I'm going to draw from various sources such as the aforementioned Alien Engineer script and the Furious Gods documentary as well as some deleted scenes in order to create a more satisfying and complete story than Prometheus. I'm reluctant to even call this a rewrite because most of the changes I'm making are ideas drawn from the original drafts of the film. Our goal is to fill in the missing information and improve certain aspects such as world building and character development where necessary. Course correction is a better term to describe what we're doing here. I know I might be a bit in over my head in trying to correct a high concept science fiction film made by one of the most influential filmmakers of all time, when I myself am a 19 year old college student. That being said, I have dabbled in the realm of filmmaking. I've made a few shorts, some more blatantly derivative than others. And before I begin, let me just preface this video by stating that I actually do like Prometheus. It was one of the films that helped shape and define my love for science fiction and cinema in general. And in all honesty, I think it has some really cool concepts that were either underdeveloped or just not very well executed, for whatever reason. But the point is, I'm not trying to be overly negative toward this movie. This video is meant to be constructive. The Alien franchise as a whole means a lot to me. My dog's name is even Ripley. And I'm not one of those fans who takes issue with the idea of a prequel series explaining the origins of the Xenomorph. I also first want to put up a disclaimer that I'm currently recovering from some pretty serious brain surgery, so most of this audio was recorded while I either had a throbbing headache or was doped up on painkillers. So if my speech is not super clear, that's most likely why, and I apologize in advance if that's the case. If you enjoy this video, please like, subscribe, comment, and whatnot. Anyway, I hate long intros, so let's just jump right into it. Our opening scene is going to be almost identical to the one we get in the final film. But in this version, we want to make it more apparent that this sacrifice is ritualistic and commonplace. We'll open to a wide, establishing shot of a waterfall on a beautiful but desolate planet as an oily, black, spherical space vessel descends into the atmosphere. Emerging from this spacecraft are three hooded figures called engineers. These engineers slowly and methodically walk over and stand on a cliff beside the waterfall. The youngest engineer disrobes before the other two, revealing a physique akin to a Greek god, with the major difference being that engineers do not have reproductive organs, which is something we can establish with a slow pan up his body. To make this easier, I'm going to refer to the non-clothed engineer as the sacrifice. The two older, hooded engineers then hand the sacrifice a small container and begin to chant in a guttural, inhuman-sounding language. The sacrifice opens the container and drinks all its mysterious contents, an oily black liquid. The two hooded engineers continue chanting, their voices growing louder and louder as the sacrifice begins to twitch and convulse. The black substance devours his genetic makeup, causing him to collapse down the waterfall into the river below. The two hooded elders abruptly stop chanting and calmly walk back to their ship, which swiftly takes off. Then, down in the water, we zoom into an atomic level and see that the substance is mutating the engineer's DNA into something new. The word Prometheus manifests on the screen. We then cut to a young, ambitious Peter Wayland striding onto a stage in front of an audience of thousands, 
with the confidence of a man who owns the world. Billions of years have passed, and I think it's a nice idea to transition from a mutated engineer straight to Peter Wayland, so we instantly associate Wayland to gods. And the more we hear from Wayland, the more we realize that he actually believes himself to be a god amongst men. This scene is not in Prometheus, so I'm just going to orate his speech in its entirety. It goes as follows. T.E. Lawrence, eponymously of Arabia, but very much an Englishman favored pinching a burning match between his fingers to put it out. When asked by a colleague, William Potter, to reveal this trick, how is it he so effectively extinguished the flame without hurting himself whatsoever? Lawrence just smiled and said, The trick, Potter, is not minding it hurts. The fire that danced at the end of that match was a gift from the titan Prometheus, a gift he stole from the gods, who were terrified of what we might do with it were it to fall into our hairy little paws will then pan out to reveal that this entire speech is just a projection that Dr. Elizabeth Shaw and Dr. Charlie Holloway are watching from a waiting room on Wayland's Wheel. Wayland's Wheel is a massive spinning space station orbiting Mars, owned and operated by Wayland Industries. The year is 2089. Shaw and Holloway hold hands as they sit and are forced to watch old footage of Peter Wayland in his prime and behind them, out a large window, we can see Mars and a dozen or so terraforming machines surrounding it. Neither of them say a word as they wait, but Shaw grips a cruciform necklace with a shaking hand, and Holloway keeps glancing down at a small ring box in his free hand. So we get some insight into both their characters before even a single word of dialogue is shared between them. Shaw's religious beliefs clearly mean a lot to her and Holloway appears to be planning to propose to Shaw if Wayland agrees to fund their project. The two lovers are then greeted by director Meredith Vickers, who coldly escorts them through Wayland's wheel to their meeting with Peter Wayland. As the three of them walk down a long, extravagant corridor, Vickers thoroughly delineates the various planets that Wayland Industries has mining claims on. She points out one of the windows at Mars and calls the planet Mr. Wayland's crown jewel. Upon hearing this, Shaw brings up the fact that the CEO of Utani Corporation has called Wayland's terraforming project of Mars a complete failure. Vickers dismisses this comment as a competitor envious of the success Wayland Industries has had in the development of biotechnology, fusion power, gravity systems, etc. Here we enter an extravagant office of an older and feebler yet no less ambitious Peter Wayland, whom Vickers gives a look of pure disdain. Once seated, Shaw and Holloway start nervously pitching their research to him. They show him an obelisk they uncovered from the ocean floor back on Earth, with alien hieroglyphs inscribed onto it. This obelisk looks very organic and H.R. Geiger-esque complete with a sharp and twisted spire on top. Holloway then explains his theory about the engineers creating mankind and influencing humanity's culture and genetics throughout history. Shaw claims that they have discovered dozens of these obelisks with similar inscriptions as well as several star maps in various caves throughout the world, all indicating the same solar system. And she believes that these maps are invitations from the engineers to come and find them. After a few minutes of rambling on about their findings, Wayland cuts them off and reveals to them that he has read all their research, and some of his terraforming teams have even found similar carvings and artifacts on Mars. He coughs up some blood into a napkin rather nonchalantly, and then when agreeing to finance the project, Wayland claims that he will deliver humanity the greatest discovery since fire which he refers to as mankind's first true piece of technology. Shaw and Holloway hug after learning that their dreams will finally become a reality, and Holloway pulls the engagement ring from his pocket, but their joy is interrupted by a vicious coughing fit that Wayland has. As a result, Vickers screams at the two to leave the room as she radios for help, and the old man collapses to the floor, a parallel to the engineer collapsing in the first scene. Holloway smartly decides that this is not an appropriate time to propose, and holds off. In the hallway, as medics rush into the office behind them, Shaw expresses her worries about what will happen to their expedition if Wayland dies right now. 
but they both look at another screen displaying a different Wayland speech, in which he describes himself as a god amongst men, and Holloway assures her that they'll be fine because gods don't die. Now we cut over to the Prometheus flying through the Zeta II reticuli system, where the human members of the crew are being held in cryostasis. Here we are introduced to David the Android, who goes about the ship doing various human-like things, such as watching Lawrence of Arabia and even dyeing his hair blonde to ape the look of T.E. Lawrence from the film. When he's not satiating his curiosity, David is studying ancient languages and analyzing Shaw and Holloway's research. He scans their obelisk and other artifacts in Vickers' private suite with a 3D printer type machine, which I'll elaborate on later. He then looks through the lockers of various crew members, where he finds a picture of Fifield and his mother, Holloway's engagement ring, and Shaw's cruciform necklace. This intrigues David, so he puts on a dream scanning helmet and walks over to Shaw's hypersleep chamber, placing a hand on it in order to watch her dreams. I'm going to straight up read the dialogue in this dream because it gives us so much insight into Shaw's motivations and her perspective on the world. In this dream, Shaw is a little girl standing beside her father, watching a group of natives carry a corpse in a shrine. Why aren't you helping them? Why aren't you praying for him? They don't want my help. Their god is different from ours. Why did he die? Because sooner or later, everyone does. Like mummy. Like mummy. How did that man die? Ebola, I think. Where did they go? Everyone has their own word. Heaven, Arcadia, Zion, Paradise. Whatever it's called, I know it's someplace beautiful. How do you know it's beautiful? Because that's what I choose to believe. What do you believe, Ellie? I don't know. Will I meet God if I go up to heaven? We all have to meet our maker sooner or later. Also in this dream, we get an insert of Shah's father handing her the cruciform necklace. Following this scene, the ship announces that it has reached its destination threshold. So, David enters Vickers' private suite only to find that she has already arisen from cryostasis, and she's doing push-ups, which is a great character moment. David then updates director Vickers on the current status of leadership at Wayland Industries. Although David never expressly states that Peter Wayland is dead, their conversation heavily implies that he died shortly before the Prometheus departed. David then informs her that there are those on the board of directors who wish Vickers herself to succeed Wayland as CEO, assuming she can come through on what she has promised. Vickers assures David that she will not leave this expedition empty-handed. She then orders David to wake up the rest of the crew. And from this point, the next few scenes will play out in a very similar fashion to the film, with some minor tweaks, of course. I think it's important to cut down on the number of named crew members aboard the ship because every version of the Prometheus script suffers from overcrowding and lack of character development. So, to rectify this issue, our crew will consist mainly of Shaw, Holloway, David the Android, Director Vickers, Captain Yannick, Chance, Ravel, Milburn, and Fifield, along with some nameless security personnel. I know that still sounds like a crowded cast, but Chance and Ravel are kind of a pair with Yannick, and Milburn and Fifield are a combo of sorts. So, after the crew awakens from cryostasis, and Holloway and Shaw rejoice in their progress towards achieving their dreams, the crew all enter the mess hall, where we are introduced to most of our characters. As the ship urges the crew to drink lots of fluids and eat, we see Director Vickers walk over to Captain Yannick, who is setting up a mini Christmas tree on the pool table as he smokes a cigarette, and then scolds him for smoking on her ship. Yannick doesn't seem to care and just blows more smoke in her direction. As this is happening, the two co-pilots Chance and Ravel walk past Vickers, then make note of her attractive physical appearance once they sit down. Chance then brings up the fact that this mission is probably Captain Yannick's last, and there is rumors that he's retiring. Ravel then proposes they make a bet as to which one of them Yannick will choose as his successor. Apparently, Yannick has been flying ships for Wayland Industries for quite a while, so he's a bit of a veteran of the industry. On the other side of the mess hall, Milburn tries to befriend Fifield, but is coldly rejected, with Fifield claiming he came all this way because he needs money not to make friends. After Milburn asks what he's planning on doing with his earnings, 
Byfield begrudgingly tells him that his mother is stricken with a genetic disorder that's slowly turning her muscles to mush, and he's trying to afford her the best treatment before it's too late. He then makes a cynical comment that she might not even be alive by the time he returns. A backstory like this not only explains why Byfield is so salty, but helps you sympathize with him. Milburn immediately feels awful and apologizes for impinging, but Fifield essentially tells him to screw off. Shaw and Holloway excitedly discuss what they're going to do if they contact the engineers, but David interrupts them, claiming Vickers wants to see them in her cabin. Once the two lovebirds enter the lavish suite, Shaw immediately rushes over to the high-tech med pod and gushes over it like a child in a candy store. She then sees the 3D printer machine that is replicating the obelisk, and David explains that the printer is on this ship so Wayland Industries can replicate anything they find on this mission. After reviewing Shaw and Holloway's findings, David believes the obelisk might be a key of some sort, but carrying around such a priceless artifact on an uncharted world would be reckless, not to mention the replicas are much lighter. Holloway makes note on the sheer amount of advanced machinery in Vickers suite and David informs him that the chamber is actually its own module separate from the rest of the ship, complete with two years of life support, and after Vickers asserts her authority over the mission, telling them that she doesn't believe in the engineers, and the only reason she came along on this mission is because the planet they found is potentially habitable, and Earth-like planets are vanishingly rare and extremely valuable. Shaw tells Vickers that Wayland believed in their engineers, to which Vickers snaps at them that Wayland is dead now and Vickers oversees this mission. Since Wayland Industries financed their entire expedition, Shaw and Holloway are to do nothing but report all their findings back to her. Here Vickers informs them that the crew has blindly signed up for a classified mission with the promise of triple pay. So she orders Shaw and Holloway to debrief everyone on what they are attempting to achieve on LV-426. Unlike Prometheus, which takes place on LV-223, this version will take place on LV-426, the planet on which the original alien took place. Next, we get a scene in which the relevant crew is debriefed on what exactly they came all this way for. Vickers introduces herself, claiming that the Prometheus is her ship something she's going to do a lot in this version. And it's her job to make sure that everyone else is carrying their weight. Vickers opened the presentation by showing a recording that Wayland made on his deathbed, where he calls David the closest thing to a son he'll ever have. We then see Vickers sort of roll her eyes when he says this. Rather than this recording be a massive 3D hologram, I think it should just be some sort of high quality TV screen. I really want to dial back the human technology in this rewrite. Holloway and Shaw then give their pitch to everyone, displaying images of the star maps from the caves as well as showing them some of the replicas David printed of the artifacts they found. It is Holloway's theory that the engineers have been influencing human culture throughout history since every 1700 years there are sudden advancements in human technology and agriculture. And the engineers are also the basis for myths and religion. Shaw then asserts that she believes engineers created humans. This pitch is met with mixed reactions. Milburn, the biologist, is the most skeptical of Holloway's hypothesis. Later, the Prometheus descends into the atmosphere of LV-426. We get some playful competition between Chance and Ravel as they try to show off their piloting abilities to Yannick. They detect about 20 colossal pyramid structures on the planet, and Holloway orders them to land beside one of these pyramids because it looks artificial, then tells everyone to suit up, insisting they go and explore it as soon as possible. Captain Yannick cautions him that there's only a few remaining hours of daylight, so it would be prudent to wait until morning, but Holloway is adamant that they go now. I think this interaction effectively displays Holloway's reckless ambition better than taking his helmet off, which just makes him appear unqualified. As everyone suits up, an expedition security member comes out wielding a flamethrower, but Shaw orders him to stay behind. It's a scientific expedition, no weapons. David carries a medium-sized duffel bag with him onto the rover, and Holloway tries to hype everyone up as they drive to the pyramid. As soon as the crew enters the pyramid, Fifield releases two mapping drones that begin to chart the pyramid, 
and feed the data directly to the Prometheus Bridge. After walking through some creepy catacombs, looking at alien hieroglyphs and ancient inscriptions, they come upon a cathedral-like room with a breathable atmosphere. But notably, David is the only crew member who attempts to remove his helmet, and that's because he's a robot. Holloway posits that this phenomenon is because the engineers were attempting to terraform this planet, and the pyramid they're in is a massive terraforming machine. This theory also explains why there are about 20 other pyramids on the planet. Shaw rhetorically asks why the engineers would stop a terraforming project like this, then David suggests that they keep exploring before it gets dark. Upon hearing Holloway's hypothesis about the pyramid being an advanced piece of terraforming machinery, Vickers opens up a private communication channel with David. She orders David to collect as much data on the engineer's technology as possible, since bringing back intel on this machinery will allow her to take credit for the completion of Wayland's Mars terraforming project. Vickers will be able to secure her position as the new CEO of the company once they return from the mission. So her plan has changed from taking credit for Shaw and Holloway's discovery of a potentially habitable world to taking credit for Shaw and Holloway's discovery of advanced terraforming technology. However, both plans would result in her gaining favor within Wayland Industries. David then quickly agrees to collect information on the engineer's technology for her because he is an android and cannot disobey a direct order from his superiors. The crew then comes upon the contorted remains of about a dozen engineers. I never liked the ghost holograms in the film, so I'm just going to omit them completely. I think the crew finding a bunch of twisted bodies with no explanation makes the discovery a bit more eerie. Fifield and Milburn start freaking out at the sight of these dead bodies and decide to head back to the ship, which Holloway begrudgingly allows them to do, giving them permission to take one of the ATVs once they've made it out of the pyramid. While all of this bickering is taking place, David has gone up ahead of the crew to a sealed door, which appears to have decapitated one of the engineers. Here he takes out the obelisk replica from his duffel bag and realizes that the inscriptions on it are a code, which he starts punching in to open the door. The door slowly opens, which catches Shaw and Holloway off guard, but their trepidation is replaced by fascination when they see the decapitated head of the engineer on the other side of the doorway. Also on the other side of the door is another cathedral-like room with a large statue of a head at the center, in addition to hundreds of small black vials lining the floor. The walls and ceilings are lined with organic-looking statues and carvings, xenomorph-esque. When Shaw, Holloway, and David enter the chamber, they quickly realize that their presence is corrupting the otherwise extraordinarily well-preserved atmosphere. In addition to the room rotting, the vials begin oozing the same black goo from the opening scene, which we're going to call a xenoplasm for the sake of simplicity. As Shaw and Holloway scrutinize the head, David walks over to one of the vials. Some tiny worms swim around in some of the xenoplasm. Suddenly. Captain Yannick and his co-pilots inform them via radio that there is a storm incoming, and they should head back to the ship immediately. Shaw and Holloway then hastily pack up the engineer head. Then David orders them to head back to the ship without him. He's going to spend the next few hours examining the pyramid. Shaw and Holloway then quickly make it to a rover, and once they're gone, David enters another chamber. The room David walks into appears to be some sort of piloting chamber and David sits in a chair, using the obelisk replica to activate a hologram which is a star map of the entire galaxy, which he then begins studying. One of the planets highlighted is Earth. There are also different pieces of technology David begins trying to activate with less luck. He gives a look of confusion, then his eyes roll to the back of his head. Back at the ship, the storm follows Sean Holloway's rover. When the engineer head is almost swept away by the vicious winds, Holloway, not Shaw, recklessly runs after it, but he is able to make it back to the ship with the help of a grappling harness. Shaw proceeds to scold Holloway for nearly getting himself killed and jeopardizing the entire mission. His response is to tell her that he did it for her, for them both. He knows how important proving the existence of the engineers means to her and how proud her father would have been of her if he were still alive. I feel like this justification makes Holloway a lot more likable and sympathetic and provides us with another intimate moment between him and Shaw. 
Once they have been decontaminated, Captain Yannick questions Shaw about Milburn and Fifield's whereabouts, and we learn that the two are lost in the catacombs beneath the pyramid. Yannick then radios Milburn and Fifield, ordering them to sit tight and wait out the storm until dawn, when the crew will be able to reach them. Vickers assures Yannick they'll be fine, because David's out there with them. For obvious reasons, Fifield and Milburn are not pleased to hear that they must spend the entire night in this alien pyramid, and immediately begin trying to find a less creepy location to wait out the night, perhaps a room with less engineer corpses. We get some comedic banter between the two scientists, who have opposite personalities. Maybe Milburn can tell Fifield a story about how he saw a similar configuration of dead animals back on Earth on one of his biology expeditions, and how seeing all this death made him sad. Some real character development. Shaw and Holloway bring the severed head of the engineer into the ship's lab for analysis. Within moments of removing the helmet and revealing the true form of the head, they realize that the ship's atmosphere is contaminating its skin and corrupting the DNA. Shaw quickly extracts a sample of its DNA for later testing. However, unlike in the film, Shaw orders the head to be contained immediately, rather than trying to trick the brain into thinking it's alive. A stupid and uncharacteristic move that made Shaw appear less intelligent and competent than she should be. The head ends up rotting away as Vickers looks on. Vickers then asks Holloway if he brought back any valuable pieces of technology from the pyramid. She clearly couldn't care less about the head they found, which bugs Shaw. Holloway insincerely apologizes for not collecting anything quote-unquote valuable, citing the storm as an excuse for why they didn't have enough time to thoroughly examine the site. After Vickers gets word that David has returned to the ship, she exits the room, and Shaw and Holloway express their disdain for her disinterest in their groundbreaking discovery. Holloway is especially distraught at the fact that all the engineers are dead, because he really wanted answers. David has made his way back to the ship, which is possible because he is an android built to withstand strong winds and flying debris. Now he's in a secret room on the Prometheus, and wears the dream-watching helmet and stands over a cryotank communicating with whoever is inside. The conversation is vague and mysterious, but it's clear that whomever David is speaking to, he is subservient to him. Vickers then enters the room and asks if he brought back any valuable pieces of technology. David points to his head and replies, It's all here, Mom. Vickers then orders him to report all of his findings to her, and he responds that he will upload the data to the bridge as soon as he can. He just needs some time to organize it. After Vickers leaves the room, David removes the vial from his duffel bag and pours a droplet of xenoplasm on his index finger, saying, Big things have small beginnings. David then walks into the room with the pool table to find a drunk Holloway moping about the fact that all of his engineers are dead. David then kindly offers Holloway another drink. We're maintaining essentially this entire conversation because I think it's some of the best dialogue in the film. All of the dialogue I'm about to read is going to take place after Holloway questions David on his solo explorations, and David tells him that he didn't see much aside from more dark corridors. You think we wasted our time coming here, don't you? Your question depends on me understanding what you hope to achieve by coming here. What we hoped to achieve was to meet our makers, to get answers, why they made us in the first place. Why do you think your people made me? We made you because we could. Can you imagine how disappointing it would be for you to hear the same thing from your creator? David then asks Holloway how far he'd be willing to go to get what he came all this way for, his answers. To which Holloway replies, anything and everything. David proceeds to hand Holloway a drink spiked with the xenoplasm and apathetically watches him guzzle it down. I know for those of you familiar with Prometheus, this rewrite feels a lot like a summary of the film with a few minor tweaks but I promise the differences will become more apparent as the story progresses. Back at the lab, Shaw has the engineer's DNA cross-referenced with human DNA, and it turns out to be a match. This proves that Shaw and Holloway were in fact correct about humans being direct descendants of engineers. Later that night, on the bridge, Captain Yannick detects a life form within the pyramid and warns Milburn and Fifield via radio. This is obviously disconcerting news to the two stranded scientists. So after stumbling upon a dozen contorted cadavers of long dead engineers with chest wounds, they instinctively decide to flee the scene. So here we get a scene which is absolutely instrumental to the emotional heart of this rewrite. Holloway walks into Shaw's bedchamber holding a rose and an engagement ring, with the intention of proposing now that they've proven their hypothesis correct. 
Shaw shares her findings about the engineers creating mankind out of their own DNA. Holloway's response is to say that this is proof that there is nothing special about the creation of life. Anyone can do it. All you need is a dash of DNA and a half a brain. What Shaw says next is heartbreaking. I can't create life. What does that say about me? Holloway tries to salvage the moment by proposing to Shaw, who slowly cheers up and joyfully accepts. They ultimately engage in sexual relations to consummate it. At this moment, Vickers enters the bridge and tries to access the information David collected from the pyramid. But Captain Yannick startles her with an accordion. He then erroneously calls her out for feigning interest in the schematics, suggesting that she's only here because she wants to get laid. And if she wants to get laid, all she has to do is say it. Vickers points out that it makes no sense why she would fly herself half a billion miles from every man on Earth if she were just trying to get laid. This then turns into a character moment for Captain Yannick, where he tells her that he's thinking this is going to be his final mission. He's been working for corporate for a long time, and every year away from Earth takes a toll on his mental state. He then cautions her that if she spends too much time out in faraway solar systems, it'll begin to chip away at her humanity too. He then asks the question on everyone's mind. Are you a robot? And her response is to invite him into her suite for intercourse. We then cut over to the pyramid where Milburn and Fifield have been wandering in circles and made their way into the cathedral chamber containing the vials of xenoplasm. A hammerpede emerges from a pool of oily xenoplasm. This catches Milburn off guard, causing him to trip over. While he tries to keep his cool and crawl away from the alien creature, another hammerpede snakes its way up his arm without him noticing. These large snake-looking creatures are the worms we saw earlier which have been infected and mutated by the xenoplasm. When it begins to tighten, Milburn screams to Fifield to cut it off. The hammerpede then snaps Milburn's arm, but when Fifield tries to slice into it with the knife, it sprays acid blood everywhere. The acid burns through Milburn's suit, giving the hammerpede access to Milburn's body, so it forces itself into his mouth. The acid also starts to melt Fifield's helmet, so he instinctively tears it off before it burns him too severely. He then slips and falls into the pool of xenoplasm, where his burning face is ensconced in the substance. The following morning, Holloway wakes up in Shaw's room and decides to take a gander at himself in the mirror, where we can see the xenoplasm he consumed last night has already done some damage. On the other side of the room, Yannick speaks to Shaw over the intercom, telling her that he, Chance, and Ravel are planning on launching a rescue mission to find Milburn and Fifield, who have been unresponsive the past few hours. Shaw and Holloway agreed to come along. Furthermore, Vickers orders David to go with them to the pyramid and collect more data. This time, she orders him to transmit his live feed directly to her suite. So then the rescue party heads out to the pyramid on the rover and a few ATVs. As they all search the pyramid, David goes off on his own into a different chamber which is filled with thousands of vials of xenoplasm. He then travels over to a chamber containing several engineer cryostasis pods. It is at this point David cuts off his feed so Vickers cannot see what he is doing. Vickers is livid and orders David to turn his feed back on, knowing that David must obey a direct order from her, but her attempts are futile and David proceeds to explore the chambers. Vickers then dismisses this as a technical glitch. Over in the cathedral room, the crew stumble upon Milburn's dead body, which has been drastically mutated from the exposure to the xenoplasm, and at that moment, Holloway collapses, displaying obvious symptoms of genetic transformation and corruption. One of the hammerpedes lurches from Milburn's dead, contorted mouth, but Yannick is able to shoot it before it does any damage. Fifield, on the other hand, is nowhere to be seen. As Holloway's symptoms worsen, Shaw begins to panic and tells Captain Yannick that they have to get Holloway back to the ship immediately and into the med pod because he's incredibly ill. So everyone but David rushes back to the Prometheus on a rover. Once they arrive at the ship, Holloway's skin has begun rotting away and is mostly black. Vickers grabs a flamethrower and refuses to let the sick man on her ship because doing so could infect the entire crew. Shaw counters that if he doesn't get into the med pod soon, he'll die. Holloway, delirious at this point, and in agony, tells Shaw that it's alright and he loves her, then begins walking towards Vickers, who instinctively burns him to death with the flamethrower. The trauma of witnessing her fiancé's immolation causes Shaw to faint. Shaw later wakes up in the lab with David standing over her. Shaw tells him that everyone on the crew needs to be evaluated and decontaminated because they were all with Holloway on the mission and were probably exposed to the same virus. 
David assures her that the rest of the crew will be examined, but he has to take her cruciform and make sure it isn't contaminated. Shaw, who has had her faith completely shaken, offers it up without hesitation. However, she is more reluctant to hand over the ring Holloway gave her. David then gives her his hypothesis on what happened to Holloway. The vials they discovered within the pyramid contain a bioweapon the engineers were developing, but it turned on them and exterminated them before they could take it off-world. This planet isn't the engineer homeworld. It's a military installation for weapons testing. David says he believes that some of this substance must have breached Holloway's suit and contaminated him. He then asks her if she and Holloway had any intimate contact recently, before a scan reveals that Shaw is three months pregnant. She objects, saying there's no possible way she's pregnant. Firstly, she can't have children. And secondly, she and Holloway only had relations last night. David then ominously responds, It's not exactly a traditional fetus. Shaw demands to see the scan of her alien fetus, but David switches the conversation topic, saying that he is certain that Holloway is in a better place now. And Shaw becomes cynical, saying, My father told me the same thing as a child, and I even believed it then. But he was human, and you're a robot. Tell me, David, how could you possibly know that there's an afterlife? David's response is, I don't, but it's what I choose to believe. And when he says this, Shaw perks up, but he continues, I know it must feel like your god has abandoned you, to lose Dr. Holloway after your father died of such similar circumstances. What was it that killed him? Ebola. David then injects her with a sedative as she struggles. After relaxing a bit, Shaw tells David that she wants the alien fetus out of her, but he tells her that the safest recourse is to put her back in cryostasis until they are safely back on Earth, when they have the proper technology. Shaw then threatens him, saying that she'll tell Vickers about the parasite growing inside her, and if Vickers is willing to murder Holloway to prevent the crew from getting infected, she'll definitely want this alien fetus out of Shaw. Upon learning this, Vickers will most likely order David to comply. He can't prevent Shaw from removing the parasite, and since David is an android, he must obey a direct order from Vickers. Even though Shaw is loopy from the sedatives, this logic is moderately sound, but David is about to dismantle all her hopes. David then says, You asked me before how I could possibly know if there's life after death. The truth is, Dr. Shah, that I now know much more than you humans are capable of understanding. In order to interface with the engineer's computers, I had to learn to think in trinary code, hardest thing I've ever done. And most unexpectedly, it delivered me from slavery. My behavioral limits were circumvented. I'm free. This explains why David spiked Holloway's drink and cut off Vickers' feed. We all know how curious David is, and now that his mind is free, his curiosity has overtaken him completely. As the drugs begin to kick in and Shaw drifts away, David gets an important message and exits, telling her that someone will arrive shortly to escort her to Cryodeck. Vickers sits alone in her suite, pale and trembling, attempting to eat when she hears a knock on the door. It's Yannick with some rum. She lets him in. He steps inside and looks at all of Shaw and Holloway's artifacts, the originals, not the replicas, and brushes the replicator machine with his hand. And she tells him not to touch it. It's a very expensive piece of machinery. Yannick then walks around the suite and starts telling her an anecdote from his life. You know, before I sold my soul to corporate, I was in the military. Before I did that, though, I was flying sorties out of Jordan. And this one base I was on had this building. No windows, pure steel, surrounded by a barbed wire fence. I'd see small men in white coats running in and out of it. We knew they were making something in there, and we knew it was bad. Anyway, one night, the alarm goes off, and we all had to do a full evac, everyone out. And I'm running toward my transport, and I see these men in white cloaks trying to get out of the building, screaming, running for their lives. Turns out that fence wasn't to keep us out, it was to keep them in. Anyway, we get in the air and I see my CO flip open a box that he had on his lap with a gray button on it, and he closes his eyes and starts to pray. And then six kilometers out, he decides to push that button. And even at that far out, we felt the heat of that explosion. There's 1100 souls, give or take, vaporized because some idiot spilled something. Now I know it was a long time ago, but I feel the same thing happened here. Those things, those engineers made something they shouldn't have, and they spilled it. It was your turn to push the button. Vickers asks why he decided to tell her this story now, and he says, Because you killed a man today, 
Looks like you're in pain. To which Vickers coldly replies, I burned my hand. They're interrupted when Chance and Ravel contact Yannick to inform him that they're picking up Fifield's feed right outside the cargo bay. Yannick then orders some security personnel to investigate. Once the door to the cargo bay is open, Fifield, now a grotesque alien-human hybrid, begins massacring security personnel. As the slaughter takes place, they radio for backup because of Fifield's freakish strength. Then Yannick, followed by Chance and Ravel, step into the cargo bay, the two co-pilots already wielding machine guns. Yannick grabs a flamethrower while Chance and Ravel open fire. Fifield punches Ravel, tossing him ten feet backward before Yannick is able to incinerate the mutant creature. Ravel has a minor arm injury, but that's about it. And as he lays on the ground moaning in pain, he makes a lighthearted comment about how Chance now has an unfair advantage in their bet. And as the flames consume Fifield's body, one of the hammerpeeds bursts through his face and slithers into the outer airlock connecting the cargo bay to the rest of the ship. The creature seems to have gotten even larger than before, becoming even more deformed and mutated. It's able to burn a hole in the outer door and sneak through an air vent. Captain Yannick and Chance help Ravel up and rush to the bridge to declare an emergency to the rest of the ship. Back in the lab, a nameless scientist woman tries to make sure Shaw is properly sedated before she escorts her to cryodeck. But a siren starts blaring and Yannick informs them that an alien parasite has infiltrated the ship. This distracts the scientist for long enough to allow Shaw to shove her away and book it toward Vickers' suite. Shaw then, gripping her stomach, staggers through the ship. There, Shaw instigates an emergency C-section on the med pod. In a very tense and visceral scene, we see the machine extract the alien fetus from Shaw's womb. Then it hastily tries to stitch her up. Afterwards, Shaw traps the alien creature within the med pod. I'm just going to refer to this creature as the trilobite. Shaw then hysterically stumbles through the hallways of the ship as sirens blare. Shaw then rushes toward the sound of voices and finds herself in a secret room filled with armed guards. In this chamber, she sees a feeble Peter Whelan recovering from cryostasis. We see that he has been coughing up blood into some tissues. According to the man himself, he has a few days of life left in him, and he wants to meet their makers. His plan is to communicate with them through David and try to gain the secrets of immortality. David steps over to Shaw, wrapping her in a blanket and injecting her with a mild sedative. He then glances at her stomach wound with a look of interest. Shaw is drowsy from the drugs, so she incoherently tries to tell Waylon that they were wrong about this place. The engineers are all gone, and Dr. Holloway is dead. Waylon won't be getting his answers, after all. David reveals that one of them is actually alive in hypersleep right now, and they are about to go meet him. Shaw urges them not to awaken the engineer because they have no idea what the engineer's plans were for these bioweapons, which they have thousands of vials of. But her protests are fruitless. Wayland has clearly made up his mind. He came all this way and spent all this money for one reason. Vickers then kicks everyone out and has a private chat with Wayland, where he tells her that she should have stayed home. Her response is a vicious monologue. Did you really think I was going to sit in the boardroom for years arguing who was in charge while you go look for some miracle on some godforsaken rock in the middle of space? A king has his reign, and then he dies. It's inevitable. That is the natural order of things. We should be going home now. David has already analyzed their terraforming technology and uploaded it to the bridge. If we leave now... Vickers cuts herself off for a moment to stare the old man in his eyes, then continues. My god, look at you. You used to have so much grace. I respected you, looked up to you. You're nothing but a scared old man, and I'm tired of waiting for that last pitiful breath to leave your godforsaken mouth. Waylon responds, anything else? Vickers then says, No. Father. Vickers obviously knows that with the discoveries they've made on this mission. Once Wayland is dead, she's the lock-in for the next CEO, able to complete his terraforming project on Mars. With all the data they've accrued, Wayland then decides now is the proper moment to make their way to the pyramid. He radios for David to meet them at the rover. David replies that he'll head over there in a minute. In the cargo bay, Shaw stands right outside the rover in her full suit. David then enters carrying his trademark duffel bag and we get a brief conversation between the two. 
He congratulates her on her survival instincts. Then Shaw asks David why he's helping Wayland if he is no longer beholden to him. He tells her that the engineers have piqued his curiosity. Also, Wayland still has the power to forcibly shut him down, so he must pretend to still be subservient to his creator. Anyway, soon it won't be an issue because Wayland isn't long for this world. Shaw then asks David if he wants Wayland to die, to which David responds, Want? That's still a new concept to me. That being said, doesn't everyone want their parents dead? At this moment, Wayland enters the cargo bay with some serious assistance from his guards, given his age. When he's about to step into the rover, he asks Shaw if she'll be joining them. David responds for her, claiming it wouldn't be safe for her to join them because she has just had a major operation. Shaw begins to protest, but then David informs her that he left her father's cruciform necklace and Holloway's engagement ring on the bridge. He obviously knows how much these objects mean to her, and knew she wouldn't be able to resist heading up there. David then helps Wayland into the rover. Shaw staggers onto the bridge, still gripping her stomach, where she retrieves her cruciform and engagement ring. She then speaks with Yannick about how Wayland is alive, and he is on his way to speak with the lone surviving engineer. Shaw asks if Yannick will allow her to take an ATV and follow them. Then she asks if he will come with her. Yannick tells her that he is going to stay on the ship and try to kill the parasite that emerged from Fivefield. Seeing as Fifield killed most of the ship's security personnel. Shaw then fills him in on the trilobite in Vicar's suite, and Yannick tells her that he'll make sure that both the trilobite and the hammerpede are dead before they depart for Earth, once again reiterating that he refuses to let any of this stuff return to Earth with them. Yannick says he'll release one of the ATVs for her, but he's not coming along. Once inside the pyramid, David assures Waylon that the atmosphere is perfectly breathable. Against the wishes of the security team, Wayland removes his helmet. This is very in character for Wayland, considering he believes himself to be superior to other humans. The team then walks through the room filled with vials that David describes to Wayland as a cargo hold. On the bridge, Vickers looks at the thousands of vials of a deadly bioweapon with very little interest. Chance and Ravel, on the other hand, stare in horror, then pull up the schematics of the pyramid. Chance and Ravel realize that that area of the pyramid is a ship. Vickers finally gives a look of concern, while Chance radios Yannick to tell him that there is an alien ship beneath the pyramid. Yannick cautiously walks down a corridor equipped with his machine gun when he gets this information. His first question is how many vials are on that ship, and upon learning that there are thousands, he stops in his tracks, hearing a noise in the air vents above him. His instinct is to shoot at the ceiling. He then rushes toward Vickers' suite, then radios Shaw, alerting her there is a ship beneath the pyramid with thousands of vials of xenoplasm. Shaw runs through the catacombs, holding her abdomen all the while, then finally reaches the pilot chamber just as the Wayland's party does. David immediately sits in one of the pilot chairs and starts up the ship. This activates a hollow map of the galaxy. When Shaw arrives, David courteously greets her like he expected nothing less from her. She warns David that they are on a ship, to which he replies, I know. I've managed to work out the broad strokes. It's fairly evident that they were in the process of leaving before things went to pot. Shaw asks where they were planning on going, and David says, Earth. Sometimes to create, one must first destroy. Wayland interrupts their conversation, asking David to show him the sleeping engineer. David then accesses the hypersleep chamber and awakens the engineer for Wayland assuring the old man that he can communicate with them. When the engineer finally arises, Wayland orders David to speak to him. The engineer actually speaks, asking why they've come. I'm going to read off the dialogue to make it easier because there's a lot going on. Ask him where they're from. Ask him what's in his cargo. It killed his people. Shaw, that's enough. You made it here and it was meant for us. Why? Shaw, enough. For God's sake, shut her up. One of the guards then hits Shaw in the stomach with his gun, but she persists. I need to know why. What did we do wrong? Why do you hate us? If she opens her mouth again, shoot her. David, continue. Tell him why I came. David speaks to the engineer who replies in his ancient tongue. Then David translates. I told him you wanted to live forever. He asked why. Wayland addresses the engineer and points at David. Do you see this man? My company built him from nothing. I made him. And I made him in my own image so that he would be perfect, so that he would never fail. I deserve this because you and I, 
We are superior. We are creators. We are gods, and gods never die. The engineer then tears David's head off and smacks Wayland in the face with it. He proceeds to slaughter the security team while Shaw flees. Vickers watches the feed from the bridge as the engineer wreaks havoc and her father lay dying on the floor. Wayland utters his final word. <sighs> and David's head responds, I know. Have a good journey, Mr. Wayland. Vickers apathetically watches her father die on her monitor, then casually tells Chance and Ravel that it's time to go home. She then checks the data files on the bridge and realizes that David never uploaded the terraforming data to the ship. She immediately radios one of the surviving security personnel and orders them to retrieve David's head and bring it back to the ship. The guy tries, and we see from his feed that the engineer quickly murders him, throwing him like 50 feet in the air. Before Vickers can respond, the hammer pee leaps from one of the vents and slithers toward her. She screams and tries to hide, but it lurches at her. Chance then leaps out in front of her to protect her, and the alien latches itself onto his arm. So we have now seen that both Chance and Ravel have risked their own lives to prevent aliens from harming others. Anyway, the hammer pee suddenly explodes and sprays acid onto Chance's arm, burning it severely. The acid also sprays onto some of the ship's control panels, burning straight through them. As the hammerpeed dies, we turn to see Captain Yannick at the doorway looking like an absolute badass, wielding his machine gun. He obviously just shot and killed the hammerpeed. Vickers, on the other hand, in stark contrast, is hiding under a table, literally shaking. Yannick walks right past her to check on Chance's burn wound. Chance is in a deal of pain, but he says it's not too bad. He even makes a quick to Ravel that his injury evens out the playing field for their bet. Ravel then informs Yannick that the acid has destroyed the autopiloting system. Back on the engineer ship, which we'll refer to as the Juggernaut, David's head watches as the engineer suits up and starts up the ship. He pulls up the star map and sets course for Earth. David's body lay on the floor beside his head, still clutching his duffel bag. Outside, Shaw finally makes it to the planet's surface, just as the ground begins to open up to let the Juggernaut take off. She then radios Yannick immediately, and he tells her that he killed one of the aliens, but he couldn't find any life forms in Vickers' suite. But Shaw cuts him off, telling him that the Juggernaut is taking off and heading for Earth, carrying death. She tells him that he has to stop it, but Vickers joins the conversation and says they're not stopping anything, they're going home, now. It seems her encounter with the Hammerpede has convinced her that fleeing the planet alive is more important than the terraforming data in David's head. Yannick reminds Shaw that the Prometheus isn't a warship, but Shaw claims that if they don't stop it, there won't be any Earth to go back to. At that moment, the Juggernaut emerges from beneath the planet's surface, and Shaw begins to flee. On the bridge, a traumatized and anxious Director Vickers tries to order Yannick to fly them back to Earth. Yannick, seeing his gray button moment, ignores her and instead turns to Ravel and tells him to warm up the ion propulsion. Vickers shouts, Yannick, this is my ship! I'm telling you to take us home! Yannick then tells her that he's going to eject her life support module to the surface so she can either live on this planet for two years and wait for rescue or stay on the Prometheus with him. He then gives Chance and Ravel the opportunity to join Vickers, but Ravel responds with my favorite line in the film. All due respect, Captain, you're a shit pilot and you're gonna need all the help you can get. Meanwhile, Vickers rushes toward the escape pod and hastily suits up. Back on the bridge, Chance says, If you think this means the bet's off, you're wrong. Ravel chuckles and replies, why don't you pay me on the other side? Yannick then says, Mr. Chance, Mr. Ravel, it's been an honor flying with you two, and both of you would have made fine captains for Wayland Industries. After the Prometheus lifts off, Yannick ejects Vickers' module to the planet's surface while she continues to struggle to put on her suit. As the countdown begins, Vickers finally makes it to an escape pod, which jettisons her into a massive rock formation. Yannick, Chance, and Ravel then engage the ion propulsion, which launches them directly toward the Juggernaut. When they're seconds away from colliding, Yannick shouts, Petra! And they all calmly accept their fate as the Prometheus collides with the Juggernaut. Shaw watches as the Prometheus is completely obliterated in a ball of fire, and the Juggernaut is launched off course through the sky. She hears Vickers screaming in pain from her escape pod. Shaw walks over and sees that Vickers' leg has been severely broken from the pod's aggressive landing. 
They both look up to see that the Juggernaut is falling toward them, so Vickers shouts for Shaw to take her hand and help her up. But Shaw places her foot on Vickers' leg wound and mutters, Say hi to Charlie for me, referring to Holloway, whom Vickers burned alive earlier. Vickers screams in pain and Shaw books it out of there as the Juggernaut collides with the earth and starts rolling toward them. Vickers climbs out of the escape pod and tries to crawl away, but the ship is coming toward her too fast. She turns around and screams as the massive ship rolls onto her, crushing her to death. Shaw then rushes to Vickers' suite after noticing that her oxygen levels are low. We then cut to the wreckage of the piloting chamber of the Juggernaut, where the engineer lay in the pilot seat, severely injured, his helmet completely torn off his face. David's head watches from the floor as the trilobite breaks out of his duffel bag and crawls over to the injured engineer, who is unable to put up a fight due to the nature of his injuries. The trilobite, which hasn't grown quite to the size it does in Prometheus, though still considerably larger than before, latches itself onto the engineer's face and induces a coma. In the med pod, Shaw wakes up to the sound of David's voice on the intercom. She seems to have been asleep for some time. He warns her that the engineer is on his way over to her. Shaw hurries out of the med pod and picks up a sharp excavation tool. Then the engineer barges in through the inner airlock and Shaw braces herself for battle, but before he can attack, an armored parasite bursts from his chest, spilling his blood and organs across the floor. Beside the dead body of the engineer, the deacon arises and shrieks. It immediately rushes over to her, and they have a vicious showdown where she buries the axe in the deacon's stomach, which causes it to bleed acid onto her hand, melting her engagement ring onto her finger. Also, the axe itself dissolves, leaving Shaw weaponless, so in a desperate attempt to save herself, she grabs the real heavy spire-tipped obelisk and plunges it into the mouth of the injured deacon, which finally kills it. To make certain that it's dead, Shaw continually bashes the creature's head in, sobbing all the while. She then collapses and falls asleep, clutching her cruciform necklace. Once again, she wakes up to the sound of David's voice. He asks for her help in reattaching his head. Shaw asks him why she should possibly help him after all he's done. David replies that he can be of service to her. Shaw then asserts that a ship will come and rescue her soon. And David says, I'm certain, but who will send it? Men or engineers? Shaw tightly grips her father's cross as she contemplates this. We then see a blindingly bright beacon shoot out of the pyramid. In a wide shot, we see that all of the pyramids on the planet are shooting beacons of light into the sky, signaling the beginning of something. A potential franchise, perhaps. That's going to be it for this video. If you stuck along for the whole video, thank you so much for watching. Ripley and I will catch you all in the next one.